In the previous video, I talked about what makes a mathematical proof and how to write them. In addition to the generalities, there are a number of special techniques for certain types of proofs. The technique that will be most useful for proofs in this course is proof by contradiction. And in this video, I'm going to describe how it works and give two examples. Proof by contradiction relies on the logical fact that any reasonable formal statement is either true or false. In logic, this is called the law of the excluded middle. Therefore, if I have a mathematical claim, it should be either true or false. To prove by contradiction, I assume that the statement I want to prove is in fact false. Then, starting from that assumption, I make logical conclusions. These logical conclusions will lead me on to an impossible situation, a contradiction. The contradiction can take many forms. A contradiction of some statement I know is true, an impossibility of a statement being both true and false, or some other situation which cannot make sense. Since I end up with this contradiction, my original assumption must have been wrong, and since I assumed the statement was false, the statement therefore must be true. I'll do two examples, both of which are classic proof examples. If you've studied anything about proofs elsewhere, there's a good chance you've seen these examples already. First, I'll prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Step one, assume the statement is false. The statement says that there are infinitely many prime, infinitely many prime numbers. If that is false, there must be only finitely many prime numbers. So my assumption is that there are finitely many prime numbers. Step two, work from the assumption to build a contradiction. The assumption says that there are finitely many prime numbers. Since there are only finitely, finitely many, I can index them. I can make a list. P1, P2, up to PK. I don't know how many there are, but the assumption says only finitely many. So the list stops somewhere, which I call the index K. Then I consider a very large number formed by multiplying all these together and adding one. So the number N is P1 times P2 times all the way up to PN plus one. Now I ask a question. What are the prime factors of this number? I know that all numbers break down uniquely into prime factors, so it must have prime factors. However, every prime number in my list, which by assumption is all prime numbers, is a factor of m minus 1. A prime number can't be the factor of two consecutive numbers, so none of the prime numbers are in fact a factor of my new number m. Step 3. State the contradiction. The number m must have prime factors, but cannot have prime factors, since none of the primes are factors. This is a contradiction. The number must have prime factors, but in fact has none. Step 4. Conclude that the original statement was false, which finishes the proof. The assumption that there were only many, finitely many prime numbers led to a contradiction. Therefore, by contradiction, I have proved that there are infinitely many prime numbers. This proof is non-constructive. It tells me that there are infinitely many prime numbers, but it doesn't tell me anything about them. What they are, how to find them, how they are distributed along the number line, etc. This is often a major weakness of proof by contradiction. They may not give concrete information about the objects in the proposition. Another classic example is the proof that root 2 is irrational. I will also prove this by contradiction. So step 1. Assume the statement is false. The statement says that root 2 is irrational. If that is false, then root 2 must be rational. Therefore, my assumption is that root 2 is rational. Step 2. Work from the assumption to build a contradiction. If root 2 is rational, then there are in integers such that root 2 is equal to a over b. And since any fraction can be written in simplest terms, I can assume that a and b have no common factors. Then I do some arithmetic with this equation. First, I square both sides, and then I multiply by b squared. Then the left side of this equation is an even number, 2 times something. So 2 is a divisor of the left side. This vertical line is the usual notation for divisors. It means that 2 is divisor of whatever is after the line. If the left side is even, divisible by 2, then the right side must be as well. The sides are equal after all. Now if 2 is a factor of a squared, then 2 must be a factor of a. If you square an even number, it's still even, and if you square an odd number, it is still odd. The only way that a squared is even is if a is even. So now I know that a is even. That means that I can write a as 2 times something. 
And that's what even means. So I can write a as 2c for some other whole number c. But then I can put this back in the equation, replacing a with 2c. I do some more algebra, squaring both terms on the right, and then dividing by 2. And now I have a 2 on the right, and I'm going to repeat the argument from the previous slide. 2 divides the right, so the right is even, so the left is even, so 2 divides b squared, so 2 divides b. What I've shown here is that both a and b are even. But I assumed that a and b had no common factors, that the fraction a over b was reduced. This is a contradiction. The assumption that root 2 is rational led to a situation where a and b cannot have a shared factor, but do have a shared factor. Therefore, I conclude the original assumption was false, and I have proved that root 2 is irrational. Proof by contradiction, as I mentioned at the start, relies on the assumption that any well-formed statement in mathematics is either true or false. That seems like a reasonable assumption in a logical system, and proof by contradiction is an important tool in mainstream mathematics. However, some versions of mathematics have rejected this assumption. There are some versions of mathematics that do not allow proof by contradiction. These are called intuition, intuitionistic or constructivist mathematics. I won't deal with these kinds of mathematics in the course, and proof by contradiction is welcome here, but it's pretty fascinating to consider that these alternate mathematics, based on an alternate choice in the logic, do in fact exist.